Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff wheat and Quaker Puff rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On, you huskies! Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker Puff wheat and Quaker Puff rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Hello? Hi, Chuck. Hmm? Well, you bet I've heard about the terrific offer on Challenge of the Yukon. Huh? Boy, am I. I'm sending for my two-way signal flashlight tonight. Listen, fellas and girls, if you hurry, you too can have a secret two-way signal flashlight. Imagine owning your own special new flashlight that's actually a two-way flashlight. Yes, this amazing super special flashlight sends out beams of red light or beams of green light. It's the niftiest thing you've ever seen for sending secret codes and messages. It's made especially for you listeners. Made so you can carry it wherever you go because it's pocket size. Listen to how you can have one of these special two-way signal flashlights. You'll hear full details on a sensational offer in just a few minutes. Nearly everyone in Dawson was interested in the trial of three men who were charged with murder. Those who couldn't squeeze into the courtroom waited outside the building to learn the outcome. One of the three defendants was well known. His name was Slade. He had worked for years in Arnold Blenheim's bank. And there were rumors that he would, if found guilty, give evidence that would involve the prosperous banker. Blenheim was not in Dawson. He awaited the verdict in a small shack about two miles from town. His companion, a hard-looking man, was named Bardo. I don't know why you're worrying, Mr. Blenheim. After what you told me, I don't see how any jury could find Slate Gilly. It's better to be prepared for the worst. Sure it is, but after all... If that woman, Margie Bevan, is in the hands of Moose Hoyt and his brother... She is. ...and her husband knows she'll die if Slade's convicted... <laughs> what would you do in her husband's place? Would you give hanging testimony to the jury? No. Hey, Bardo, what's that? The dogs, of course. They see someone coming. Yes. Probably it's Grievich. I'll take a look. Is it Grievich? Yeah, and he's traveling fast. Hi there, Grievich! Still here? Yeah, he's here big as life, but his new mucklucks and Parker are all set to hit the trail. Then he had better hit it. What's that? What's that, Creepy? I said you'd better hit the what trail. What happened in town? What happened? The worst. The trial is your worst. Yes. The verdict is guilty. What? Slade is due to hang. He's determined he won't hang without you. When I left, he was telling the court that he was working in your interest yes. and under your orders when that newspaper man was killed. Yeah. Well, tell me all about it. How did the jury happen to decide Slade was guilty? We're ready to move as soon as we hitch the dogs. Then get him hitched. Well, I tell Blenheim what happened in Dawson. Yes, yes, tell me. Go ahead. I'll let you know when we're ready. Come in here, Krivich. Close the door. Did Bevan give his testimony in spite of the fact that his wife was held as hostage? Bevan was on the witness stand. He was evading and sidestepping. Yes. His testimony wouldn't have been worth a dime until Sergeant Preston came into the court, and they had Marge Bevan with him. He did? When Bevan saw that his wife was safe, he told everything. Uh, then his father took the stand and testified, and Marge herself. <laughs> the jury brought in a verdict of guilty without even leaving the box. Now Preston's looking for you, with a warrant for your arrest as an accessory before the fact. Yes, sir, I've got to get away. I've got to get across the border. You and Bardo promised to get me out of the Yukon territory. You've got to keep your word. You hear me, Cleavage? You've got to keep your word. Take it easy, Blair. Take it easy. Yeah, but call my shirt. We'll get you across the border. Does anyone know you left town to bring the word to me? No. Does Preston know where to find me? Of course not. How would he know where you're hiding? He don't even know you left town. With that dog named King, if 
he can follow my trail. He can't. The snow's been falling hard ever since you left Dawson. Your tracks are all filled in. I noticed that when I came here. That's for your scent. Your clothes are all new. (laughs) There's a limit to what even King can do. Doctor, I'll hit you. Come on, then. We've got to hurry. We've got plenty of time. In an hour, we'll be at Hairpin Canyon. And after that, it's open country. We can watch our back trail as we move. Preston won't catch up with us. Don't you worry. Blenheim was too fat to walk or ride the runners of the sled. He rode beneath a heavy bearskin blanket. Crevich handled the dog team, and Bardo trotted alongside. In about an hour, they came to the brink of Hairpin Canyon. Oh, boy, oh, oh. Why have you stopped? We can't lose time. Keep going. Take it easy, Blenheim. We've got to rest the dog. But we Blenheim, can't. Blenheim, it's about time you stopped giving orders. Why, you... You've covered your trail, Blenheim. He's done better than that. He hasn't even left a trail. There's not even a cent for King to follow. That's right. Blenheim hasn't put foot on the ground since leaving the shack. He's the only one the Preston's looking for. Ain't that so, Creasy? Yeah, that's so. No one has any cause to look for us. Nope. Fact is, if we left Blenheim here, no one would have any idea we were mixed up in this escape. Uh, nope. What do, you, what do you mean? Why, why are you talking like that? <laughs> he wants to know why we're talking like that. Yeah. <laughs> Tell him, Creevich. He's got to know sooner or later. Yeah, he's got to know. I may as well tell him. But what's the matter with you two? Why, why are you looking at me? This is the end of the trip, Blenheim. What? Steady. Stay right there on the sled. A gun? Don't try to get up. Just stay right where you are on that sled, beneath that nice, warm blanket. What you, you, what's the meaning of this? We want cash just as much as you do. We'll go just as far to get it. Grievich, got the traces on the sled. Yeah, wait, right. wait, listen to me. Shut up. No, let me up. Let me out of here. Grab his head. Right. That's it. That'll hold him. You got the traces cut? Yeah. Grab that money while I turn the dogs loose. All right, get up there. March. Hey, go on, march. Go on, clear out. There. That'll take care of them. They'll be found, and everyone will figure that Blenheim's sled broke loose and went over the canyon. They will if it's found on the floor of the canyon. Here, give me a hand push her over. I'm ready. I'll put the cash down here. Now, come on, together. Shout! There she goes. Look out! That's it, Krivich. The sled has smashed the smithereens and so is Blenheim. Now let's get onto that shack you own near Faro City. With this cash, we can live the life of Riley. <laughs> Sergeant Preston spent the entire day and evening trying to serve the warrant on Arnold Blenheim, but no one had seen the banker. It was not until the following morning, two hours after the bank had opened, that the Mountie realized the truth. He got it from the constable. I got it straight from the assistant manager of the bank. Blenheim's disappeared and taken a wad of money with him. Bank money? Yes, he's taken all that paper currency. There's nothing left but gold and silver. Anyone in the bank know anything? No. How much cash was taken? Well, they'll have to tally up all the records to get the exact amount, but it's well over $20,000 and about two-thirds of it's new money. New money? Yeah. Paper that had never been circulated. Hey, hey, Sergeant Preston. Huh? Someone's calling him. <laughs> That's John Bevan. Well, King recognized him. I thought he and his wife and father left Dawson two or three hours ago. They did. They were going back to their home at Gopher Rapids. What's he doing back here? We'll find out. Hello, John. What brings you back here? Where's your wife and father? They kept on going toward home with the sled and the dogs. What are you doing back here? Found Arnold Blenheim on the trail. Oh. Blenheim? Yes. Last time I saw you, Sergeant, you were looking for him with a warrant. That's right. We just learned that he had skipped out with a lot of the bank money. Well... He's dead. What? Dead. We were traveling through the bottom of Hairpin Canyon. We found him and the ruins of his sled close to the edge. I'd say he went over the rim. Give me ten minutes to get my gear together, and I'll go with you, John. Good. Constable, I'll take King and go with Bevan. You hitch a dog team and follow along with the sled to get Benheim's body. Come on, boy. Sergeant Preston didn't take his team or sled, but the great dog King accompanied him when he went with John Bevan to the place where the body of Arnold Blenheim lay amid the wreckage of his sled on the floor of Hairpin Canyon. Preston examined the banker carefully. Broken bones, many bruises, but no knife or bullet marks. Did you expect to find anything like that? I wonder who did this. Who did it? I'm pretty sure one man, at least, was traveling with Blenheim. Why do you say that? Because, John, you're no thief. Thief? What do you mean by that? We've gathered everything that went over the edge. Ruins of the sled, the blankets, the bearskin, food supplies, everything. But the money's not here. 
Oh. And when I left Dawson, he carried a lot of paper money, new uncirculated money from his bank. And here, John, look at these harness straps. I saw that they were broken. I figured that that's how it happened that the sled went over. Broken nothing. They were cut. Mm. That being the case, what's our next move? I'd like to help you if I may. I can use some help. We'll wait here until the constable comes with the sled to remove the body. And we'll take King up to the rim of the canyon and see if he can pick up a trail. John watched Sergeant Preston and his dog at work on the rim of the canyon. The new fallen snow had filled in the tracks that had been made on the previous afternoon. But the Mountie knew approximately where the sled had gone over the edge. He and King cast about in wide circles, paying particular attention to the ground where trees grew densely enough to provide a limited amount of shelter. Here they found tracks that had not been completely filled in. Tracks that had been made by dogs. They're wandering at large. Do you think they belong to the team that pulled the sled? Probably, but it's not dog tracks we're looking for. Here, Bevan, look at this. Boots. Two men went through here. Here, King. These are the tracks we want, boy. Heading north. Can you get the sad fella? What does that mean, Sergeant? He has it. On, King. Lead the way, boy. We'll follow. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Gee, it's dark out here. Billy, I can't see a thing. Me either. I wish we knew what to do. Hey, Mary, look. Look over there. See those green and red flashes? Yeah, I see them, Billy. Why, they're aimed right at us. They're the signals we're waiting for. See? Two green flashes and three red flashes. Oh, that's our gang. Over there in the woods. They're signaling to us. That's our secret code. Those flashes mean come at once. But keep your eyes open. There may be danger. Well, that's our code, all right. Flash an answer to him, Billy. Okay, here goes. I'm sending out three green flashes. That means we're coming on the double. Fellas and girls, for sending secret codes and messages, boy, oh boy, the new official challenge of the Yukon secret two-way signal flashlight is out of this world. Believe me, don't wait to send for yours. You'll want one. This secret signal flashlight is a real flashlight. It's a special kind. Yes, it works two ways. It sends out beams of red light or beams of green light. It works with just the flick of your finger. And it works much like blinker signal guns used by the Army and Navy. It has a special plastic directional signal barrel. That's so your secret signal flashes can't be seen. That is, except by the person at whom they're aimed. You can carry this two-way signal flashlight with you anywhere. It slips right in your pocket where no one can see it. Yes, your new official challenge of the Yukon signal flashlight is pocket size. And it's a beauty. Shiny black in color, and it has Sergeant Preston's name in his own handwriting across the side. What's more, it comes complete with standard replaceable electric bulb and battery. It's the real McCoy. Now here's how you can get one of these amazing two-way signal flashlights. This very evening, put 25 cents in coin in an envelope. That's just 25 cents. Also include your name and address printed plainly on a slip of paper. Send together with one box top from Quaker Puffed Wheat or Quaker Puffed Rice. That's one box top from Quaker Puffed Wheat. Or Quaker Puff Rice. They're the swell taste and cereal shot from guns. Mail to Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. Got it? The address is Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. And here's a tip. Hurry. Send tonight. Now to continue our story. After leaving the scene of Arnold Blenheim's murder, Cravage and Bardo traveled all night to reach a shack at the edge of a tough mining community known as Pharaoh City. Tired to the point of exhaustion, they slept all day. It was late afternoon when they awakened, pulled on their boots, and dressed in anticipation of a gala evening. Cash is hit away, isn't it, Cravage? (laughs) Sure. Don't you remember we put it under the floorboards beneath the bunk before we turned in? That's what I thought, but I was so doggone tired when we got here, I couldn't be sure we took care of it. (laughs) It's taken care of, all right. I don't suppose our tracks would be followed, huh? (laughs) The way it was snowing, those tracks were filled in half an hour after we made them. All we've got to do is play it careful. 
We don't want to go around spending a lot of cash all of a sudden to make people suspicious. No, we won't. Like you say, Kravich. We'll play it careful. I would just... Hey. What's that? There was someone at the door. What'd you think it was? Don't be so skittish. No reason why we shouldn't have a visitor. Coming to find out why this cabin's lighted and who's here. Press. Oh, hey, Bardo. I wondered who I'd find here. Want to talk to you. What do you want here? You too, Kravich. Come on, King. Hey, keep that dog away from me. King won't make trouble unless you start it. I think both of you know John Bevan. I've seen them in town, but I've never met them. Yeah, I've heard of you. What do you want, Preston? The cash you stole from Arnold Blenheim. Why, Take you... it easy, Kreevich. What are you talking about, Preston? I'm talking about a banker who was killed when his sled went over the edge of Hairpin Canyon. Now listen, Preston. For a long time you've been trying to get something on me. But this is just about the most far-fetched deal I ever heard of. Here, yeah. you followed my trail. You couldn't follow any trail because of the snowstorm. And what's more, me and Kreevich were nowhere near Hairpin Canyon. Well, that's several hours of the trail from here. Can you prove you weren't there? No. And you can't prove we were. King followed your scent. I saw him do it. He came directly to this cabin. Our scent? He followed our scent all this time? <laughs> Listen to him, Kreevich. Well, what are you going to do about it, Preston? Put us under arrest for robbery and murder and then go into court with flimsy evidence like that? Oh, you know you're not. When I take you into court, there'll be evidence enough to hang you, both of you. Don't make any arrests until you're sure of that. Do you suppose King could have made a mistake? That's always possible. <laughs> if I've made a mistake, Bardo, I'll apologize. I'm pretty sure the men I want came this way. I'll stay around here for a while and keep my eyes open. Come on, King, let's get going. <sighs> what do you make of that, Sergeant Preston? Bardo was pretty sure of himself. Do you think he's guilty? In spite of what I said, King does not make mistakes. I'm sure Bardo's guilty, but I can't prove it. I can't arrest him and take him to Dawson without more evidence. How can you get it? John, you came along to help me. Yeah? Well, that's what you're going to do. Well, stay here in Faro City. Now, come with me to the hotel and we'll make our plans. One, King. King lay on the floor of a first-floor hotel room. His chin rested on his extended paws. His ears were alert, and his eyes fixed steadily on Sergeant Preston as the Mountie and John Bevan prepared a move calculated to get evidence against Creevage and Bardo. This disguise will be crude, John, but I think it'll be adequate. <laughs> Where did you find these clothes, anyway? Borrowed them from a friend of mine here in Farewell City. Now, uh, rub some more of this stuff into your hair so it'll all be black. Oh, did I miss a few places? I'll be right here. Here, look in this glass. <laughs> Dark hair sure changes a man's appearance. Use plenty of that minstrel makeup. When I start to getting rough with you, what's King going to do? Don't worry about King. I'm going to leave him here in the room. Now, uh, here's the money. Put it in his pocket. It's brand new, just like the money Blenheim took from his bank. Do you really have the serial numbers of the bills that were stolen? No, but Bardo and Creefitz don't know it. Now, put that cash in your pocket and then take this. Oh, that's the electric signal light my dad made for you. Take it with you and give me a signal as I explain. Right. I sure hope things work out as you expect. If we don't find them in one cafe, we'll find them in the other. Let's go, John. Bardo and Creevich sat at a table in the Ferrell City Cafe, enjoying a hearty meal topped off with wine. At first, they paid no attention to a slim man wearing the clothing of a prospector who sat down nearby and ordered a meal. They were more interested in Sergeant Preston, who stood near the door with his back against the wall, eyeing the patrons. Why don't that Monty go away and leave us alone? Oh, Creevy, you're just trying to get under our skin. Mm -hmm. You follow us and watch us in the hope that we show signs of nervousness. Huh. We're in the clear. He can't prove a thing on us. This meat's no good. What's the matter with that critter? What's the matter with you, mister? I said this meat's no good. It's tough. Too well cooked. He's oh. looking for trouble. Yeah. Now, look here, sourdough. If you don't like the way we cook our food, you'll go somewhere else to eat. Look here. If I've got enough to buy this place. Maybe I'll do that. And if I don't like the way you treat a customer, I'll fire you. Put your cash away, mister. We've heard big talk before. Just a minute. What do you want, Monty? You're waving some new money around. Yeah, what about it? Hey, Bardo. 
No money. Let me see it. Not so fast. I want to see the serial numbers on that currency. Where'd you get it? It's mine, see? Where I got it's none of your business. Oh, yes, it is. I'm looking for some money like this. I guess I've been suspecting the wrong men, eh, Bardo? Uh, what's that? <laughs> now, see here. Better come with me. We'll talk this over. Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right, Marty, I'll go. I'll go like you said. But not with you! Out of my way, everybody! You hurt, Sergeant? No, I'm all right. Just knock the window out of me. I'll get that phone. Excited comments fill the cafe, but men in places of that sort had learned to mind their own business. No one interfered with the man in snow glasses who fled through the door to escape from Sergeant Preston. Crevich looked at Bardo, and Bardo returned the look. What do you make of it, Bardo? You heard what the Mounties said. He knew the serial numbers of those bills. He spotted them in some of Blenheim's money. But how could it be? The cash we hid was new money. Remember that? Would I forget it? Do you suppose he found our hiding place? I don't know. He's a stranger to me. He looked like a drifter. A lot of drifters use that cabin where we hold up. Well, I'm going to look and see if our cash is still there. I'll go with you. After leaving the cafe, Sergeant Preston made a pretense of going in pursuit of the disguised John Bevan. But after traveling a short distance, he cut back to the hotel, went to his room, and got his great dog, King. Bardo and Crevich went to their cabin. I got a match right here. I light the candle. I don't see how anyone could have found that cash, but I'll feel better when I'm sure. Don't seem to me that that critter in the cafe would wave the money around right under our noses. We didn't know it was ours. Hey, Crevish, someone's been here. Yeah. Sure enough. Look, our gear spread all over the place. Quick, Barlo. Pull up that floorboard and see if the cash is still there. Well, that's what I'm doing. It would be easier if we moved the bunk. No, I can reach under it. Here we are. Is it there? Look. The pack is just as we put it there. Unwrap it fast and see if we... Uh, what's the matter, Krivich? Someone's in the woodshed. How do you know? I heard the floorboard creak. Get your gun handy. I'll open the door, son. I'll talk normal. Well, it beats me. I don't see how Preston could have made a mistake in the serial number. No, Get him up! Oh, you're covered! Come in here, you! <laughs> All right, All right. You had me. We saw you in the cafe. Yeah, you were waving cash around. Now take that gun. Uh, wait just a minute, fellas. I'm hiding from that Marty. I wonder. Give me those snow glasses. Hey. Let me have a better look at you. There's something about you that's familiar. Bardo, I know this critter. Come here, you. Give me your hat. Let me have a look at your hair. What's the idea? Put those guns down. Listen to Not me. Not so fast. Look at this, Bardo. Black stuff on his hair. Come off in my hand. The last time we saw this gent, his hair was light, and he was with Sergeant Preston. John Bevan. The same. All right. So now you know. So you and Preston put on an act. You tried to make us believe you'd found the Blenheim money. And we played right into your hands, didn't we? Yes! Yeah, stop, stop! Get him! He knocked me off balance. Here, let me get this door open. There he is. Don't shoot him. I'll fix him. Gun barrel did the job all right. Did you kill him? Oh, I didn't hit him hard enough for that. Hey, look. Something in his hand. It's shining red. I see what it is. It was a light of some kind. Yeah. Here we are. Look at this, Bardo. This little black cylinder shines a red light at the front. Yeah, here's how it works. You push this little button at the back. Hey, that's pretty slick. I know what it is. That electric signal light I heard about in town. Bevan's father made it for Sergeant Preston. It's got the Mounty's name on it. Look. Now it's green. I moved this lever. Hey, give me that. Oh, now I savvy why Bevan made that sudden break. He knew he couldn't get away, but he wanted to flash a danger signal. Listen. Preston's out there and back somewhere. What are you doing? I'm signaling with a green light. Stand ready. We'll see what happens. You think it will bring Preston here? It's doing that very thing. Look out there. See? He's coming. I... I don't like the idea of killing a Monty. That particular mounty has been living on borrowed time. Bardo made sure Bevan would remain unconscious for the next few minutes. Then he drew back with Krivich. The two held their guns in readiness while Sergeant Preston approached the cabin, boldly circled from the rear to the front door, and walked in. Get him up. We got you, Preston. 
Aren't you men playing a dangerous game? Dangerous for you. <laughs> he saw the green light and thought Bevan was sending for you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you figured he had the situation well in hand. So you know about his signals? You bet we do. And if you're curious about your pal, he's back in the woodshed. And he'll be unconscious for some time. At the Blenheim money in those packages? Yeah. I don't mind telling you now that your hunch was right. That was a clever trick you tried to pull. Only it sort of backfired, didn't it? No, not a bit. Oh, no? I half expected I'd walk into the muzzles of your guns. That's why I told King to stay back. He's just waiting for the word from me. Take him, King! What what the... What's it? Look out! Let me go! No, my arm! Pardo dropped his gun when Preston's bullet struck his arm. King had a grip on the forearm of Creepy, who was trying to bring his gun to bear. Then Sergeant Preston closed in. I'll take that gun. Come on, my arm. I tell you, my arm is broken. On, King. Right, like boy. On guard. Keep an eye on this one while I get Creepy. If either of you try a fast move, King will take over. You're both wanted in the name of the Queen for the murder of Arnold Blenheim. John Bevan regained consciousness to find Sergeant Preston bathing his face with cold water. In the candlelit room, he saw Bardo and Creevich handcuffed as prisoners and a bandage around Bardo's wounded arm. King stood watching the two. You're all right, John. You just got a hard rap on the head. Yeah. Headaches. Guess I'm all right. Our plan worked. These crooks had the money out in plain sight. I, I tried to send you a warning signal. I saw a flash of red, and then it disappeared. When I saw the signal light again, it had changed to green. We had you, Preston. You walked right into the trap. We had two guns on you, so don't you go taking any bows for capturing us. You wouldn't be in handcuffs right now if it wasn't for that dog of yours. Well, that's true, Bardo, and you're not the first crooks who've had the same complaint about King. This is just one more instance where, because of King, the case is closed. <laughs> In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Monday's adventure. Don't be left out. Get in on the fun. Don't be without your new official challenge of the Yukon two-way signal flashlight. That's the special new kind of flashlight that's two-way. It's two-way for flashing signals. Yes, like Sergeant Preston's. Like the one he found so useful. With a simple flick of your finger, this amazing signal flashlight sends out beams of red light or beams of green light. You can't beat it for sending secret messages and signals between you and your friends. So don't be left out. Supplies are limited. Act fast. To get your two-way signal flashlight, just put 25 cents in an envelope. Also enclose one box top from delicious Quaker Puff wheat or Quaker Puff rice and your name and address. Mail immediately to Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. I'll repeat, that's Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. These radio dramas, a feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle and directed by Fred Flowerday. This story was written by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun. Listen Monday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case River Pirates. My friend Steve Ballard was a lighthouse keeper. King and I went with him in a launch to meet the riverboat that was bringing his wife from Dawson. We knew that something was wrong when we saw the boat was out of control and headed for the rapids and destruction. That was just the beginning of one of our most exciting adventures. Be sure to hear this thrilling adventure Monday. Till then, this is Jay Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.